The Khuzri principle argument is the primary outreach argument of Orthodox Jews to establish that Orthodox Talmudic Judaism is the one true religion. The Khuzri principle is as follows. Suppose that at least 100,000 people claim to witness a certain event. Then almost certainly, this event must have occurred, since only Judaism claims that its origins are in national revelation rather than just in personal revelation, it must be the true religion. There are two versions of this argument of which I am aware. Here is the first. Judaism makes these four claims. 1. At least 600,000 Israelites gathered at the bottom of Mount Sinai over 3,300 years ago. 2. All of the Israelites heard God speak to them at Mount Sinai, and they then asked Moses to be his prophet. 3. Moses received the entire Torah from God and taught the Torah to all of the Israelites standing at Mount Sinai. 4. And most importantly, the Israelites transmitted the Torah and also the history of the transmission process of the Torah from generation to generation in an unbroken chain of generations for over 3,300 years until today, with at least 100,000 Israelites in each generation of the chain. Here is how the proof is supposed to work. Suppose that a hundred thousand people all claim to see a flaming unicorn appear in their midst. Is their testimony likely to be true? Well, I guess so. Suppose these hundred thousand people form a community and all tell their children about the flaming unicorn incident. Is the witness of that entire generation, that second generation, enough to establish that the first generation believed they saw a flaming unicorn? I think so too. When a third generation is produced, it attests the validity of the second generation's beliefs, which attests the validity of the first generation's beliefs, which attests the validity of the original event. No matter how many generations from the event you go, as long as you have that unbroken chain with at least 100,000 people in each generation, you have proof of the original event. In this way, the modern Jewish people are in a sense direct witnesses to the events on Sinai. So what's the catch? Why is this argument so thoroughly rejected by liberal Jews, many modern Orthodox rabbis, and even some Haredim? The fatal flaw with this entire argument is the central claim itself. Remember what it states. Suppose that at least 100,000 people claim to witness a certain event. Then, almost certainly, this event must have occurred. Do you see the flaw? This version of the Kuzari principle argument is really nothing more than a Sorites paradox. What is a Sorites paradox, you may ask? A Sorites paradox is a paradox that arises from vague predicates. The paradox of the heap is an example of this paradox, which arises when one considers a heap of sand from which grains are individually removed. Is it still a heap when only one grain remains? If not, when did it change from a heap to a non-heap? Just because a sand heap can remain a heap when you remove one grain of sand, it does not follow that you can remove any number of grains of sand and expect that it will still remain a heap. Likewise, if you hear the testimony of 100,000 people that they witnessed an event, is it the same as witnessing the event yourself? Is there absolutely no difference? I think there is. Hearing the testimony of the second generation attesting to the first generation is not as reliable as hearing the testimony of the first generation directly. You lose credibility with each generation. In order for this version of the argument to actually work, the Kuzari principle would have to be reformulated as, suppose at least 100,000 people claim to witness an event then 100% certainly, or 100% minus some infinitesimal number, this event must have occurred. But that's obviously false. Hearing the testimony of 100,000 witnesses just is not the same as being an eyewitness to the event. If we think of this proof in mathematical terms, suppose we attach a percentage of certainty to the 100,000 witnesses. Let's say the witnesses of 100,000 people gives you 97% certainty that the event was true. The 97% figure I picked out is for illustration purposes. It's just as arbitrary as the 100,000 figure. So speaking to the eyewitnesses of the event, you're 97% certain it happened. Speaking to the children of the eyewitnesses, you're 97% certain that the parents believed it, which, if true, would give you a 97% chance that the event happened. So 97% times 97% is 94%. Not too bad. At the 20 generation mark, that brings you to 54%, 20 more generations takes you to 30%, 20 more generations after that, which gets you around the time of the Maccabees, gives you about 16%. Today, we're about 150 generations off, so even with these generous probabilities, you've got about 1% certainty based on oral tradition alone. So the first version of the argument gets an epic fail. Here is the second version of this argument. Premise 1. Suppose that a group of 100,000 people claim that they have an unbroken line of tradition that a certain number of generations ago, at least 100,000 people saw a single, spectacular, memorable event that we will call a national experiential tradition 
or net for short. Premise 2. If that claim is false, it would have to be introduced at some point without the event taking place. Premise 3. But such a claim of that type cannot be introduced without the event taking place. Conclusion. The claim must be true. This is a better argument, at least this version is not fallacious. However, premise 3 seems weak. Why can't such a claim be fabricated? Proponents of the argument will usually give two reasons to support premise 3. First, all proposed scenarios where the claim slips into a national culture are implausible. How do you convince a nation of 100,000 people that such an event took place? Do you do it all at once? My answer is, no. You can bring it gradually through legendary development. Legendary development is a process by which oral traditions change as they are passed on from generation to generation. The details change and the stories often take on larger than life characteristics. Once you get past the two generation mark from the original event, legendary development will often begin to wipe out the historical core. An example of this would be the legend of King Arthur. Worse, the argument assumes a society in which texts and information are widely distributed, so that people, when receiving a new text or story, will know that it is new. However, this is often not the case in ancient societies. People often had only the vaguest knowledge of their own family or national pasts, and were aware that information might well be slow in circulating about which they knew nothing. If an individual learned of what happened, or what appeared to be that information, it would be welcomed and not questioned. The second reason to believe premise 3, this one is supported by Dovid Gottlieb, is that there are no counterexamples. Specifically, there are no stories that fit these five criteria. 1. The story must describe an event witnessed by a nation of at least 100,000. 2. The event must be one that would have created a national tradition. 3. The story was in fact believed to be true. 4. The believers included the nation composed of the descendants of those to whom the event was supposed to have occurred. 5. The story is in fact false. These criteria seem both conveniently vague and enormously ad hoc or contrived. It's almost as if, in formulating the argument, Kotlib did a survey of religions, observed which characteristics make Talmudic Judaism different, and made those characteristics his criteria for what constitutes true religion. Even if documents of a previously unknown ancient religion founded on national revelation were on earth, Gottlieb could use the ambiguity in terms such as national tradition and redefine it to include Judaism and exclude the other ancient religion. And since such a religion would be long dead, one could not prove that all the descendants were believers. Also, why the figure of 100,000? Is 5,000 somehow not enough to verify an event? Gutlieb's methodology is like shooting an arrow into a tree and then painting the target around it. Since Gutlieb has a degree in philosophy and mathematical logic, I hope he also realizes that there is no such thing as proof by lack of counterexample. Not in mathematics, not in philosophy, not even in history. A theorem is not proved by failing to find a counterexample, otherwise theorems like Goldbach's conjecture or the continuum hypothesis should be considered proven. This goes for science as well. If I claim that there can be no gold spheres larger than 20 feet in diameter, and claimed as my proof the fact that there are no counterexamples, I do not think that anyone would accept that. Similarly, a historical hypothesis is not verified by a failure to find evidence against it. Instead, you have to show that if the hypothesis is false, there would be evidence against it. In that case, the proponent of the Kuzari principle argument has the full burden of proof. Good luck with that. Besides, if we drop the arbitrary 100,000 requirement from the argument, then there is a plethora of counterexamples. The Kurukshetra War in India, the founding of Thebes, the founding of the Aztec nation, to name just a few. But speaking of counterexamples, why are there no ancient Egyptian records of such an event taking place? The Kuzri proponent will probably say, the Egyptians did not record their defeats. Well, hold on there, Sparky. Doesn't that suggest that the Egyptians published a history and the millions of Egyptians that read it accepted it as true, even though they knew it was false? So can you cause multitudes to accept a false history or not? Which is it? You cannot suck and blow from the same explanatory pipe at the same time. It may also be the case that premise one of the argument is false. The Torah might not claim that there were at least 600,000 at Sinai after all. I think the problem is in assuming that the Hebrew word Eleph, in the context of the Pentateuch, only meant thousand. It could just as well have meant clan, then we'll get a number between 70,000 and 140,000. This figure is more consistent with the ancient population statistics, as well as ancient archaeological evidence. Alexander the Great had only about 50,000 soldiers with him when he conquered Persia. Hannibal had about 20,000 soldiers with him. There were only about 20,000 soldiers in Egypt's army during the height of its power. So why would an Israelite army of 600,000 be afraid of them? Also, if the larger figure is true, 
a mass exodus of three million people leaving Egypt, wandering through an uninhabited wasteland for 40 years, and then invading the Canaanite area would leave a massive trail of archaeological evidence. However, the much smaller figure would be able to make this type of journey without leaving such a gigantic trail. But if the smaller number is true, then the number at Sinai could be as low as 10,000 and we would not have the necessary 100,000 for the Kuzari argument to work. To repeat, I am not saying that the story of the Exodus is false. I personally believe that it is true. I am only arguing that it is not provable in the way that the rabbis want it to be. By extension, the rabbinic claim of an unbroken and uncorrupted line of rabbinic tradition and oral Torah that dates back to Moses and Sinai is also not provable. Shalom Aleichem.